no electric. This, this woman wrote in a letter, I've been busy, so busy I could not write. I have sewed so much that I've cut my fingers bad with the thread. She's literally working her fingers to the bone. <laughs> Since sewing was a woman's lifelong work, children at four years old were started with the skill of sewing. They had to do a sewing stint each day, which was an allotted amount of time. So by the time they were seven or eight years old, they were experts at sewing. People think of Singer as one who invented the sewing machine, and he is credited with the first practical sewing machine. But there were others before him. This is in 1830, Bartholomew Thimonier, <laughs> what a name. <laughs> he invented the sewing machine, it's wooden. There is a prototype of his machine. And he had 80 of these machines sewing uniforms for the French army. And he was doing very well. But, you know how we are resistant to change? We really don't like change. Change can be quite threatening. A mob of tailors, they were afraid that they'd lose their livelihood. You know, it was pretty hard to eke out a living in those days, 1830, uh, you know, it could mean life or death. So this mob of tailors broke into his factory, which was the first clothing factory in the world, and they destroyed every one of his 80 machines. Well, he was pretty well off, so he could rebuild, and he rebuilt his 80 machines, started up again, the same thing happened. Only this time they were going to kill him. So he barely escaped alive and the poor man died penniless. <laughs> so next comes Elias Howe. And he was 27 years old in 1841. And he invented a lock stitch. Now Bartholomew's was a chain stitch, like the feed sash, you know, you would pull a thread and the whole thing will come out unless it's fastened off. So this is a lock stitch. It had a shuttle that the thread passed around, and it had a needle with the eye in the point of the needle. Now it was said that that came to him in a dream. He was, in his dream, he was imprisoned, and he had 24 hours to invent a sewing machine. But they were taking him out to kill him, and the warriors, he noticed, had a hole in the pointed end of, the, of their spears. And that's how he got the idea of the sewing machine needle that we still use today. And see all these, see all these little points? Where's the laser thing? Right? See these little pins sticking out? The fabric had to be put on a basting board. And it could sew the length of that basting board. Then you had to take everything off, put the fabric on that basting board again, and sew some more. And you can see his arm of the machine. It goes like this. The fabric is vertical. So he showed this machine in front of a group and showed that it could do the work of five seamstresses. But nobody wanted to buy it. Nobody. I couldn't believe it. But then I read further, and it's because he wanted $300 for that machine, which amounts to $8,000 today. So it was, people were kind of afraid of it. But the biggest thing was, again, those tailors. They were very resistant <laughs> and threatening. Do not put this into production. So he went to England to try to sell his machine and he got kind of swindled over there. He came back without any money. We'll, whoops, we'll talk more about him later. Then, 1851, Isaac Singer. He patented the sewing machine. 
what happened was but when uh, Elias Howe was trying to get a machine, there were already 80 patents for sewing machines. Trouble is, none of them worked. <laughs> so Singer was asked to improve this non-working machine. And at first he said, a sewing machine? Why would I be interested in that? It's the only thing that keeps a woman quiet, her sewing. <laughs> Finally, he was persuaded to do this, and he's credited with the first practical machine. However, he had two partners. There were actually three people working on that. Why the others didn't get credit, I don't know. And he kind of swindled one partner out of the whole thing. So Singer, as the inventor, was quite the guy. As a man, hmm. <laughs> he had a wife and family in New York. He also had four other families in Manhattan, <laughs> none of which knew about the others. And he had 20 children. <laughs> So he was found out, was about to be arrested for bigamy, fled to England, where he met Isabel, who posed for the Statue of Liberty. She was 19 years old. She was married. She left her husband to marry Singer. Look what money will do. Singer was 50 years old. She was 19. And at, at the time, Singer's machine started to go into production. Pretty soon, patents were just coming hot and heavy, more than you could count. There was, it was called a patent thicket. And people started suing each other right and left because everybody was borrowing and stealing the patents from the others, changing them a tiny bit. So it was called the sewing machine wars. And here are some of the machines, those early types. This is an American. There's an Elias Howe. That's a Bremer and Bruckman Brunonia, a German machine. That's a Folsom, that's from the 1860s. This is a Leggett, a French machine that works by pump action. So with all those, uh, Suits going on, they formed a patent pool and shared each other's patents. But Elias Howe is the one who really won because they had to pay him $7 for every single machine sold. Everybody. So he became a millionaire. But uh, a machine at that time cost $125 which is about $3,500 in our money. Jesus. And when you think someone with semi-skill could earn $40 a month, it puts sewing machines out of the reach of a lot of people. But then, factories started because machines were kind of taking off. So mostly in factories. A clothing machine factory in 1860 was turning out about eight, 800 shirts a week, 400 machine operators could equal 2,000 hand sewers, those poor tailors. But clothes became a lot cheaper. This is the time for garment stitch. Look at frock coats. 16 and a half hours, two and a half hours by machine. <clears throat> Gentlemen shirts, 14 and a half hours. They do it faster than I do. One hour, 16 minutes. Yeah, they're a lot faster than me. <laughs> a dress, six hours and a half by hand, less than an hour by machine. This. The Civil War is what really brought machines to the forefront because the Union Army wanted all their uniforms to be sewn by machine. So it really doubled the amount of machines in use. 70% of 
Union <coughs> uniforms were sewn by machine. The South, they didn't have industrialization and they had blockades and all that. Only 2% of the South was sewn. But those, the machine sewn uniforms were a lot more durable. And at this time, the Union Army also asked, if any woman has a machine, put it to use sewing for the war effort. Whether it's a uniform, a shirt, a little cot quilt that they sent to the hospitals. But there was still opposition. Now, up to this time, up to 1860, most of the machines were in factories. And the companies were really pushing household machines. But there was opposition, mainly to a woman's place in society. No one wanted to be called a blue stocking. A blue stocking was an intellectual woman. <laughs> And that intellectual woman was considered very unfeminine, off-putting. It could threaten a man's natural intellectual superiority. <laughs> a true woman followed her natural instincts of child-rearing, domestic duties, and spiritual comfort. <laughs> And given the mindset of the time, the surprising dangers of the sewing machine. <laughs> now women were considered their mind to have limited capabilities. They could not operate a machine. Such things as the study of higher math could cause insanity. <laughs> Doctors were expressing concerns that operating a sewing machine could damage eyesight, cause feminine exhaustion, damage the female reproductive system, <laughs> oh my, <laughs> cause uterine prolapse, <laughs> miscarriages, the treadle, operating the treadle could be scandalous. One doctor observed a woman with her treadle sewing machine. All of a sudden she became flushed, her breathing became very fast. She fanned herself. She looked around just so embarrassed, but then went on treadling. It had masturbatory effects. <laughs> There's the treadle sewing machine that caused so much grief <laughs> with women. So companies really pushed, we want women to have a sewing machine. So they said, so simple, even a child can do it. Getting around the fact that women couldn't operate a machine. And then they showed women with their children, see she's doing her family duties, Happy women in a household, sewing away. This is an ad, there's a Wheeler uh, Wilcox and Gibbs machine out there. They're advertising. A new operator can do better with it than an old expert worker. It can be used by delicate women without detriment to health. <laughs> So Clark, the singer partner that ran the company, he was really pushing sewing machines everywhere and he was fantastic at selling and advertising. He came up with the pay-as-you-go plan, which was very new, very novel at that time. You put a small down payment and pay so much a month, no one had heard of that before. So he's, that singer company is just as famous for that as for the sewing machine. They had door-to-door -door salesmen, and they could take trades. One farm woman talked about, I got my machine. I had a tiny little bit of money, but the salesman went away in his wagon with a couple of crates of chickens, a few dozen eggs, and two bushels of produce, and the promise for a little cash sometime later on. <laughs> Thank you.
Owning a sewing machine became a source of pride. Uh, when you could have a photograph done, you showed all your prized possessions. <laughs> they were very proud of having a sawed house. The man's pride possession was his team of horses. The woman's was her sewing machine with a baby sat on it. I wonder if it means the sewing machine's as important as the baby. <laughs> And Singer wanted the sewing machines sold around the world. That's the best way to carry a sewing machine that I know of. <laughs> then they had uh, trade cards, collectibles, like you collect baseball cards, you could collect sewing machine cards. And this is Bulgarian family and she's sewing on her machine. This photograph is of a Blackfoot camp taken in 1900, and Singer thought that was just great, and they made a puzzle out of it, a collectible. <laughs> and then, of course, other companies followed suit. <laughs> they had some pretty humorous yeah. ones. <laughs> There's a new home, I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know if I'd go for that quite. <laughs> now, if you, had a sewing machine, you wanted to show it off. The, the handles on these baskets, it's applique, but the applique was done with a sewing machine so that you could see the machine stitches visible. It said, I own a machine. <laughs> this is a very famous quilt, the Bible quilt. It's in the Smithsonian. And it was made by Harriet uh, Walters, I think her name is. She was born into slavery in 1837. She made this quilt in 1886. And it surprises me that she owned a sewing machine. But her applique, this is the Bible quilt, her applique was done with a machine. And see, we might think of it as rather crude, today. There's the visible machine stitches. Then she traveled out to the edge to do the next. But I'm sure she was very proud of owning a machine. Not everybody could. And she had to sell her quilt very reluctantly. She sold it to Ms. Smith and she wanted $10 for it but the lady only had $5. So she said, I've got to ask my husband. She really didn't want to sell it. But she went out to the ox cart wagon and asked her husband, came back and said, my husband said to sell it, so I will. And the $5 was equal to about $170 today. But this Miss Smith wrote in a letter, she was not a new woman, so she did what her husband said. So I think by 1890, maybe women were getting to think a little more independently. Some. This is also done by machine. You, if you were up close to that applique, you would see all the machine stitches on that. And that's, that looks like quite an advanced applique there. This is the earliest known machine quilted quilt. And it's a potholder quilt where each block is quilted separately and then the finished blocks are sewn together. But look at her design. There's a basket with flowers. There's some circles. In that time you would uh, loosen the pressure on the presser foot and hold that fabric, kind of stretch kind of tight and sew around. And this is the machine that she used, a Grover and Baker. And this was done in the 1860s. A Grover and Baker is what's called a double chain stitch machine. <coughs> and I don't have one of those and I want one. <laughs> then specialty machines came out. This one is just to sew straw hats. That's a cobbler's machine for shoes. This one is just to sew purses. Look at that. 
Then some <coughs> other machines. This one is uh, Wilcox and Gibbs for delicate women. <laughs> and it's a chain stitch machine. This guy fought in the Civil War, Gibbs. And when the war ended, he lost everything, but he kind of snuck his way up north to meet his partner, Wilcox, who had saved his share of the money. This machine became quite a sensation. It's called the light machine, no tension adjustments, anyone can use it. <coughs> this is a, a weed, a weed machine from the 1870s. Now what does the weed machine, the bicycle, and the Colt revolver have in common? Interchangeable parts. Interchangeable parts. Colt, the arms industry, was the first to have interchangeable parts. Before that, uh, castings were made and skilled fitters would file them and machine the piece, pieces down to make one machine. But that part couldn't go in any other machine. So they were one of the first, and Singer, it's called the European method. Singer didn't use that method until quite a bit later. These were one of the first. This is a New England or a Raymond machine, and the inventor, Raymond, moved to Canada so he didn't have to pay royalties. And this was considered a very inexpensive machine. It's another chain stitch, and he started selling in England again to avoid any royalties, and it's reported that women were sitting in their carriages lined up for blocks to get this new, novel, inexpensive machine, which they considered quite adequate for their maids. <laughs> <laughs> but in 10 years, this was obsolete. You couldn't sell them. This is a Shaw and Clark fire hydrant machine, or pillar machine. It's another chain stitch, and it was sold as very inexpensive, fine machine. But they were flying under the radar. They didn't pay any royalties. 1860 to 1863 is when this machine was made, because then they got caught. And they started having to pay royalties. And so then they changed their advertisement. 1864, many persons who have sold or used the bogus, infringing, cheap machines that flood the market have done so innocently, not knowing their danger, until their property was taken, or they were imprisoned by the United States Marshal. <laughs> they were something. They didn't last too many years after that. Then on the left there, is a Fancy Lake Florence. Isn't that a gorgeous machine? I don't have one of those either. <laughs> and then sewing machine inventions, they just kept going. This one, the treadle of the machine can create music. Patented in 1882, a cover for a sewing machine provided with a musical instrument and means for transmitting motion from the shaft of the sewing machine to the operating parts of the musical instrument. Kind of like a player piano. <laughs> <laughs> this one I love. A steam motor heated on the Collinwood Range <laughs> being used to power a sewing machine from Law Nature, 1883. <laughs> That prevents the exhaustion from traveling. <laughs> this is a family affair. This family likes togetherness. But while they're having recreation, the woman has to work. <laughs> and most, any machine, most of them can be repaired. This is a treadle base. Look at the condition of that. And see all that rust? Mm -hmm. This is the before. There's the after. Ooh. My husband does all that. He's nice to have around. That's why I keep him. <laughs> and this is a machine. It's a, a Minnesota. 
Look at that thing. It was frozen too. You couldn't turn the wheel. But after some wire brushing, steel wooling on all the moving parts and oily, it started to turn freely. Look at, look at that bobbin winder. That's the way the whole machine was. Look at that knob. Now it's been cleaned up and it moves. Now it's getting, oops, now it's getting the gold leaf on it. All that is gold leafing. And then you brush it away, and there's the finished piece. And that's the part I do. <laughs> so we've fixed a lot of machines, and most of them can be repaired. And thank you, the archives, and in memoriam to Sarge. <laughs>